great to have all of you here with us. I think this is a, a great way for us to begin our Lent. In the book of Sinai, we hear, store up almsgiving in your treasure house. It will save you from many kinds of evil. And I'm sure in some way, Father John will be thinking about treasure and connecting with alms, one of the priorities of the Lenten season. So I think this is especially apt. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Father Joe. He's been picking up some hardware since you last saw him. He received the Boston Medal at the Catholic University of America last October, which is a medal for his distinguished work in history. So we're very fortunate to have Father Joe with us tonight to help us understand treasure in heaven equals treasure. Thanks, Garrett. It's very nice to uh, be with you, and welcome to this first series of the Franciscan Vision uh, this semester. So I'm glad you could come here. I understand that I'm competing with the debate, but I would suggest that if you don't know what they're going to talk about by this time, you probably will never find out. So treasuring heaven equals treasure on earth. What I'd like to do is just try to give some insights into the Franciscan vision of politics and economics and society and how they mix together. I graduated from college in 1968 and in September 1968 went up to Berkeley. September 1968 was quite a time in Berkeley. And I remember the evening, first evening I got there, Governor Reagan called out the uh, National Guard with the bayonets, and they stood on the corners of Euclid Avenue as I walked through the university up to the Friary. And uh, the flower children were there because that was the height of the flower children movement, pinning roses on the bayonets. And I can remember thinking, well, now this is a different place than Santa Barbara, California. <laughs> and I wonder in myself at the time, does the Franciscan way of life have anything to say to society? And at that time, we were dealing with issues of poverty and race and war and many members uh, of the Franciscan family, male and female, seculars and religious, uh, many friars and sisters got involved uh, in whether well, it was Selma, Alabama, where they had been, or it was on the war in poverty and working in the inner city. In, in many ways, uh, they tried to alleviate human suffering. That was kind of the first experience that posed a great question for me because I grew up in a, a rather closed Catholic world and then a rather narrow Franciscan world where the religious life, as we understood it, had very little to do with society and politics and economics. And I'll explain that in a minute. That's the kind of the first experience. And then uh, a few years ago, I was at a uh, general chapter, and there was a friar there from Egypt. And uh, Egypt, uh, Christianity is a minority religion, and the friars were trying to witness to some kind of peace in there. And they were describing the difficulties of public worship and the violence that surrounded him. And I, I was in a small group with one of the friars from Egypt and he screamed out, we were discussing something, and all of a sudden it came out of him. He says, oh, in this world for a little bit of gratuity, graciousness, peace. And, and it just struck me so much. And we see in the contemporary scene also the uh, difficulties uh, politically, uh, the differences, vast differences uh, between uh, Bernie Sanders, let's say, and Hillary Clinton on the left, or even between Donald Trump and Marco Rubio and Mr. Cruz 
and Jeb Bush on the right, they all, they may belong to the same party, but they don't agree about how do we use our resources, how do we divide them. Uh, they all tend to argue from the same base, but they come out in different places. And as you know, the rhetoric is very strong and sometimes kind of vicious. And that's the public world we live in right now. So it's always been a question for me as to does the Franciscan tradition and being president of a theology school, does the theology school have anything to say about how we might contribute to these discussions? Not that our frame of reference would ever become dominant or the way we see things would be the way everybody sees things. That's not the point. The point is from our tradition, what do we want to give witness to in whatever circumstance we're in and whatever politics we agree with? How do we want to be in that situation? So these have always been questions for me. Uh, and there was a very uh, little way to negotiate it, to be quite honest, uh, in school and tradition because people weren't relating Franciscan life to these kinds of questions. It was kind of a, a language that had disappeared. As I began to study this and experience more, uh, the question sharpened a lot and most recently, we've been privileged to live in a time when thinking about how these two things relate from the perspective of the Franciscan tradition has, co what has come into clarity. Uh, and I'd like to share with you some of the insights from that that has emerged from both European scholarship and contemporary biblical scholarship. Garrett made reference to the book of Sirach, and I'm afraid I will purloin some of that this evening, uh, because what's happened in the last 10 years has shed a tremendous amount of light on the Franciscan understanding of social and political engagement under the code word Franciscan commitment to poverty. It means something different than we think. I've also discovered in society that there are developments there where people are making some connections. Now I'm going to give you one example and we're going to go through it very rapidly because it doesn't deal so much with Franciscan life, but it deals with the different ways we think about society. And a professor from in business and law has come up with two different kinds of ways of thinking about property, where the economic world is self-regulating and self-contained. So it's discussed by itself as if it were a thing in itself removed from people. Its purpose of economics is to grow, to increase personal and national wealth, uh, to distribute it also, and to unite people through buying and selling property, law, uh, exchange, consumer goods, you name it. And its basis is generally impersonal, the relationships of property, labor, land, and money in our society. He contrasts these, and this is only a model, not meant to capture everything, name is Marvin Brown, with an economics of provision, which he says we need today. Now this economic of provisions asks, how do we inject into our discussion a moral dimension. And we can take as an example, how is the moral dimension injected into the political discussions we're undergoing today? The economy's purpose is to protect providers from exploitation and degradation, the, the dignity of work and the worker. And citizens exchange in the economics of provision land, labor, money, based on civic norms of reciprocity, moral equality, plus response to supply and demand. So there's this type of moral dimension injected into economic thinking. Certainly this is part of what 
the Pope is arguing today. So I'd like to talk about, in this context, in Economia Franciscana, Franciscan economy, through an initial insight and experience, and then unpack this notion of treasure in heaven, ask what is our basic commitment, and look at it as it applies to different ways of life. In Economia Franciscana, how do we interpret Francis's vision of the glue of society, the practice, as he would have called it, of voluntary poverty? Francis doesn't practice poverty, he practices voluntary poverty as he grows up as a merchant and engages the life of the poor and neighbors. Actually, it's the life of anyone who is suffering. I believe we live in a privileged time where an opening has been given to the Franciscan family to think in these terms, and that opening has been provided by the thinking of Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. Not only do we have an opening in the church that coincides with what contemporary popes are teaching, but I believe it's also a cultural necessity that somehow we engage this world, certainly here in an educational institution, but in many places. Because our tradition of poverty, this is for the friars, has been confined to the sacristy. Poverty is an asceticism. Poverty is a simplicity. Poverty means withdrawal. Poverty means not using these things or those things. But poverty for Francis, I would argue, didn't mean any of that. Poverty represented for him a vision of how society and people in it should engage each other. And generally, as I travel around the Franciscan world, and this is a loss, again for the friars, the language of the early tradition has completely disappeared. So we don't think about what's the relationship between how we live upstairs and how we live out there. And certainly, when you talk to people, they see no relationship <laughs> between how the friars live upstairs and how they might live in the world. And that's the bridge we're trying to bridge. Benedict the Sixteenth, Caritas and Veritate, Francis the First, Evangelii Gaudium, Laudato Se, uh, all of those uh, move in a single direction in terms of a social vision that makes our way of life uh, contemporary. It contrasts a bit with the culture of prosperity. Uh, I had an experience a few years ago. I was teaching a course in Franciscan spirituality, and in the in the classroom, uh, there were we. I had seven Korean Presbyterian ministers, and the rest were. Uh, Catholic laymen and women, and a couple of friars. And it was the most interesting class to have all these people together. And I gave each of them an opportunity to write a uh, paper. All the Korean Presbyterian ministers, Lazarus, came to me, and they all wrote on the same thing. They said, we want to write on Franciscan poverty all independently. I said, why do you want to do that? He says, because the churches in our country have committed themselves to a gospel of prosperity, whereby the, the wealth that people attain and the success of their life equals blessing from God. So that work, efficiency, productivity are associated with this gospel of prosperity. I see Lazarus shaking his head, yes, it's true. And they said, but yours is the only tradition we believe that has a way of speaking to this and offering a counter model. I've mentioned the chasm between uh, the religious world and the secular world, the type of the only voice we hear basically religiously in society is that of a very, very narrow uh, vision of an economics of prosperity, whereby individual self-initiative and business acumen 
amount to the blessing from God. And it's the social message of evangelicalism, which could be so strong in some, is largely missing from the discussions in our political world. And we live in a globalized economy of the market, which has both strengths and weaknesses. Certainly we know that our economy historically is built on the self-interest, competition, it is self-regulating generally, so with some government intervention, and it places an emphasis on profitable business plans and plans for the future. Look at the insurance world, look at the hospital world, look at the educational world, look at the government and the measurements that are brought to bear upon what succeeds and what does not. And yet, it also captures very good human values. Productivity, surely productivity, creativity, efficiency, and the increase of well-being is a good thing. And our economic world tries to contribute to that. So there's weighing it out, there's good things and there's not so good things present in the dominant models. I speak as an historian and most of the historians would argue that these types of values shape our world and we participate in them. In this context, Francis believes, growing up as a merchant, he looks at the Eucharist, and I looked at this kind of clearly, it's, it seems kind of stark. But I believe a Franciscan spirituality, the Eucharist is an economic act. We don't think of it that way, but it is the way he sees it. Because the Eucharist represents Jesus' self-giving. Everything that he has is an act of generosity for the neighbor. Everything he has is given to him from his father and his mother. The word became flesh, and he begged that flesh from a human being, and he gives that flesh away. And Francis has a simple remark, one who gives himself totally to us, surely we would respond by giving ourselves totally to others and to God. It's an act of self-giving, which is at the center of Franciscan spirituality. And Francis will try to translate that into politics and economics. The principles not of self-interest, but self-giving. Those who deny themselves will discover themselves in the deepest sense possible. So he sees that, and you can see that in the writings. When he's converted, he belongs to a state of life in the church, a eremitical state of life, which is a status. And he takes off the habit of a hermit and puts on the habit of what? An ordinary laborer. He moves, in Pope Francis's terms, to the peripheries. He's not looking for status or power, although he will acquire both status and power. But his way of doing it is to become an ordinary worker with other human beings who create, who make, who are uh, for others. And so he puts on that habit. That's what it represents. And at the center of Franciscan spirituality is the dignity of being human. I love this phrase from Gaudium et Spes when it says, In some mysterious way, by becoming a human being, the Lord has united himself with every human being in the world. In some way, Christ is present in every human being. And the response to that is the recognition of each individual's unique dignity 
made in the image of this word who became human being for us. Once again, the action of Christ in the Eucharist, the action of putting on the flesh of a human being, dignifies all human beings and shows us the path to create a society of dignified human beings by the exchange of generosities. And, of course, the uh, solidarity with the poor, the famous picture there from the Depression era. Where are the poor and the consideration of them? Because in becoming poor for us and looked at from the perspective of the word, the word taking on human flesh is an act of becoming poor for someone else. By becoming poor, the Lord makes us rich with his presence. So this consideration of the poor, human dignity, the Eucharist as an act of generosity, an economic act of generosity, all of those fundamental values are embedded in the Franciscan vision. Francis learned this from the time of his initial calling. And these are quotes taken from the biographies. Uh, the, he heard the missionary discourse from the scriptures. Take nothing for your journey, neither walking staff nor traveling bag, no bread, no money. And that's what he did. We might not want to do it, and we don't have to do it. But Francis's clarity of choice illuminates our small choices. Provide for yourselves with neither gold nor silver nor copper in your bags, no traveling bag, no change of shirt, no sandals, no walking staff. Now the question is, if you were to do that, what kind of economy would you live in? What kind of politics would you create? Because all of those things deal with human exchange. Wallet, money bag, staff, bread, gone. Security, provision, self-sufficiency, protection. What is he getting at? Because Security, provision, self-sufficiency, protection are also good things, not bad things. What is he trying to get at by taking this action? Well, I'll give you an example. We say, well, Francis was completely insecure. Well, nonsense. He begged from people he knew, his friends, wandered around Assisi. They knew who he was. He went and begged from them. Well, that's not much of a, you know, he's not totally insecure. He relies on other people. He's certainly self-sufficient in his travel. What he has, he owns a mountain, so he's not completely poor. He receives it. He takes bread from the Benedictines. We have to rethink this whole thing. He's protected by the other people and the military in Assisi. He's not without protection, and yet he is. What, what is he getting at? What I'm saying is he's not leaving the world entirely. He never leaves the world entirely. He can't leave the world. None of us can leave the world entirely. Who would want to? The world was created by God. The world's things are good. There are many values in the world that are good. And yet, he's trying to tell us something. I think embedded in it are, for example, if I give up everything, take nothing for the journey, look at it this way, what am I left with?
Hmm? Myself. He's trying to say something. You have in yourself all that you need because you're a creature of God, worthy of the incarnation. You have eyes, ears, hands, feet, thought, creativity, and you didn't make it. It was given to you. No matter what your state is, frail, old, young, you have all that you need, but not just in yourself. You can work. And he places a value on work. That's a good thing. So we earn our living by the work of our hands. And he places a great emphasis on work in his testament. Work is a good thing. He doesn't flee work. And not only does that, when you have only yourself, you have also other people. You have friends. But because you have nothing, you learn relationships. You learn dependencies. You learn what others can give. You become, in a very focused way, a receiver of the dignity and work and self of other human beings because there's nothing in the way. So the whole commitment is designed to affirm human dignity, to affirm the dignity of work, and to create relationships of interdependence between people. Now we're beginning to get at a social vision. If you wish to be perfect, these things he quotes in his earlier rule. And it's important to note that he quotes them together from Matthew. If you wish to be perfect to the, uh, the rich young man, go. He had obeyed all the commandments. He'd done what was right. He was, from the Jewish perspective, a righteous man. And the Lord says to him, if you wish to be perfect, that is, become like God, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. If you want that kind of thing, if your desire is so great that you want to be in the fullness of God's image, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. There's that phrase. Then come, follow me, because that's what I did. The Son of God did that. And then it goes on, the story goes on to say, and everyone who has given up home, brothers or sisters, father or mother, wife or children, or property for my sake, all those things I left, will receive many times as much. Where? Here. And inherit not only this world, but eternal life. So it opens him up to be grateful for everything that is and to recognize what comes his way he receives from the gift of God. It opens him up to gratitude, beginning with himself, his ability to create, his sight, his hearing, whatever, his friends who are given to him, the Lord gave me this, his learning, his education, love, engagement in a project. What a wonderful world that is. But if you really want to live a life of complete and total gratitude to become like the Son of God was before his Father, then Go sell what you have, give to the poor, have treasure in heaven. How does that work out? 
So the kingdom of God is right in our midst. Complete biblical vision. And we can do it. Each of us in his or her own way. I'll come back to that in a while. The beauty, the birds, the earth itself, all is a gift to which we open ourselves. We engage in this Franciscan asceticism of generosity in action. Let's go a little bit deeper now into the biblical foundations of this. And I'm indebted in this kind of thing to a lot of work that's been done by Peter Brown on the early church, most recently, or Gary Anderson's books on sin and charity, both deal with this. And that's all new thinking that's emerged uh, on the landscape in the last five or 10 years. So uh, you can be the first to hear it. <laughs> okay, this is the way they put it together. Garrett knows all this. He, treasure in heaven, where that phrase comes up in the biblical material. Your father is pleased to give you the kingdom from Luke. And then the passage, the great passage, which is cited uh, so central to the Franciscan vision in Matthew chapter 6. Just uh, listen a bit. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't grab them, keep them for yourself. Where moth and decay destroy and thieves break in and steal. The course of our life, most things disappear. And we learn to value maybe that which is truly the pearl of great price. But store up treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor decay destroy, nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. They do not sow or reap. They gather nothing into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more important than they? Will he reject his own created human beings, those made in his own image? Learn from the way the wild flowers grow. They do not work or spin, but I tell you, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was clothed like one of them. If God so clothes the grass of the field which grows today and is thrown into the oven tomorrow, will he not much more provide for you, O you of little faith? So do not worry and say, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? What are we to wear? All these things the pagans seek. The issue is not whether we have clothing or whether we eat. We have to, well, we don't have to, but we generally clothe ourselves. We do need to eat. We need to breathe. We need all those things. He says, don't worry about it. Don't let it become an anxiety that drives life so that one must completely create a world of security self-containment, self-sufficiency, where you move outside of the circle of the gift. All these things the pagans seek, but your heavenly Father knows what you need. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, food, clothing, etc., will be given to you. It's the same message we saw before. You will have treasure in heaven. Give to the poor. You have treasure in heaven. Keeps repeating it. The biblical background is very much connected with li wisdom literature 
and the story of Tobit, which we won't go into in much detail. But this is from Sirach. By works of charity, one offers fine flour, and one who gives alms presents a sacrifice of praise. This particular phrase is written at a time when the Jerusalem temple has been destroyed and the Israelites are in exile. And what, note the first phrase, offers fine flour, that's a sacrificial offering in the temple. But there's no temple. So where does worship occur? Worship occurs in acts of generosity between people. The temple is in our relationships and we worship God every time we perform an act of charity or almsgiving. Worship is daily in the world through the relationships we create. Do not turn your face away from any of the poor so that God's face will not be turned away from you. The advice Tobit gives to his son. The basic principle is enunciated in Proverbs 19. Whoever cares for the poor lends to the Lord, who will pay back the sum in full. Now, let me explain that, just in economic terms. Whoever cares for the poor lends to the Lord will pay back the sum in full. Who's the creditor? You. Whatever you have. Goods, power, dignity, education, prosperity, resources, sustenance, feelings, touch, forgiveness, presence, whatever you have, whoever gives to the poor, you're the creditor when you give to the poor. The debtor is the poor, the one who is suffering, the one who's without, the one who is in some way spiritually or materially deprived or the one who is frail or sick or disfigured, the one who's ignored, who's misplaced. That's who the poor is. And sometimes we're the poor. And we become the debtor to someone else's generosity. It happens all the time. People are united through interdependence and the exchange between them. Now we're talking an economy between people of exchange of generosity and reception, each giving to the other what each has. But the one thing about the poor and the frail, the sick, is they don't have any resources to return in kind. That's what makes them poor. So who in their right mind would give anything away to the poor. Without demanding something in return. Or without saying, hmm, if you produce so much within six months, you're okay. And I'll continue to help you. Because now you've proven yourself. What if they can't? What if they don't have any resources to give back? And the poor you always have with you, the Lord says. What if they can't enter into social charity of entrepreneurship? Which is a good thing. What if they can't get into that world? But this is the issue C. When you give to the poor, particularly those who cannot pay back, you take a risk. Suppose you forgive someone who has no intention of forgiving you. They're poor, you forgive them, they give nothing back. Suppose you simply give lavishly to someone who is poor, 
knowing that they will have no means of paying it back. Who furnishes the collateral? Because no one makes a gift or a credit without collateral. So you say to the poor person, okay, where's your collateral? Who backs you? And the poor person says, I have the greatest banker of all, God, who owns everything, who is the Lord of the universe and owns all that is. This is in the Franciscan world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and those who dwell in it. They translate that psalm economically. So Francis has ownership of nothing. And in owning nothing, he owns everything. Because God's the banker, the collateral who will provide house and home and children and family and lands and properties a hundredfold in this world. And life eternal in the next. That's credit, debit, banker. So who would not take that risk to follow the Lord Jesus, who gave everything in the hands of his Father and who received what? The kingdom. A hundred times over and life everlasting, the resurrection. Where heaven touches earth in the economy of Franciscana, heaven touches earth in the person of the poor because the poor become that place where I encounter God's generosity. If I give to the poor, God's promise is that I will receive a hundredfold. The poor, the point of the poor, is the place where I encounter the banker of all things. This is the way they're thinking. In the person of the poor and suffering, in the risk of faith in God's promise, this is why the whole Economy of Franciscana, of course, is based on faith, Christian faith. Do I believe the word of God? If you leave brother and sister, property and family, you will receive a hundredfold. Francis quotes it at the beginning of his, do I believe that? Well, only sometimes. Very difficult. But he illuminates something really important about human relationships and the way we are to live. Here is where faith is injected into society through reliance on God's promise. And in the patience to await fulfillment. What if God doesn't give back? One day is as a thousand years, they would respond. God always gives back. Maybe not now, maybe not tomorrow, maybe after three days, maybe to my children, maybe to the next generation, maybe I don't live to see it, but the promise will be fulfilled. And I engage as the Lord Jesus engaged in the patience to await fulfillment in the knowledge that the father of all cares for his son and his daughter and will lead their aspirations to fulfillment. The promise, I solemnly assure you, the word of God says, there is no one who has left home or wife or brothers, parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God 
to enter into that, who will not receive a plentiful return in this age and life everlasting in the age to come. I've talked to many people who care for the sick. I've talked to husbands and wives who care for an ailing spouse. I've talked to uh, lay people and sisters and brothers who work among the poor. I've talked to people who have gone miles to share with a friend. And invariably, they will say, I say, that's a great thing you do. And they say, it's nothing compared to what I got. I was rewarded more than a hundredfold by a simple act of charity. Embedded, that's the economia franciscana. When we give to the poor, we receive back. We have to open our eyes. And so there they are. Houses, children, etc. That's the way they put it together, biblically, economically, socially. It's a new social imagination. And if they don't receive it now, it will be promised later in eternal life. There we see St. Clair being crowned. But she received plenty in this life too. Bread was multiplied, oil was given, friends came, she saw Francis, she had numerous monasteries, sisters and brothers, more than she could ever count. She who became poor. And in the age to come, she was crowned. So the Franciscan economy is designed to unlock the gratuity of God working in the hearts and minds of others. You see, it's based on the principle that God is in the world and God desires to give to us. But do we open ourselves to receive? To receive the world around us? other human beings, the beauty of our own souls and selves, our life, creation, friends, the things we've accomplished, the community we live in. That's all a gift. God wants to work in the hearts and minds of others to help us. God wants us to be co-workers and co-lovers working in the world to spread this lavish and generous economy of life. Gratuity, graciousness, gratitude. God wants to reveal the glory and power of God hidden in the depths of all that exists. I could give you many examples of this and I'm sure you can from your own life. Just think about it. How many times has something or someone dropped into your life with some degree of surprise that has proven to you just what you needed? In conclusion, Francis of Assisi's commitment to be poor so that he might become rich, because he doesn't commit himself to be poor so as to be poor, but to become rich. He wants to enter the kingdom of God, <clears throat> is a path of discernment. And he will say this over and over in his writings, and the tradition will say it, so not everyone practices this way the same way. And this is a big mistake that has been made in the past. How can a married couple practice poverty the way a Franciscan friar does? Impossible. The responsibilities are different. How can those with children practice it that way? They can't. They don't have to, he says. Because everyone is uniquely created and dignified by God and led along the way of Christ. But what he's trying to point to is 
do we inject into our life gratuity, the free gift of who we are and what we have to others? And does that circle of gratuity become ever larger? So he develops these principles of discernment where there is poverty with joy, there is neither greed nor avarice. Where there is a heart full of mercy and discernment, there is neither excess nor hardness of heart. And that's for each of us to determine freely and willingly. But he's pointing us to a life of superabundance. Alexander of Hales, one of the great things, and Bonaventure put it in terms of the superfluous. The superfluous is that which one can be without according to just necessity and pious utility. And Alexander of Hales adds now, just necessity for a king is not just necessity for a friar minor, is not just necessity for the noble or the serf or the worker. That's a whole different thing. So apparently just necessity and pious utility refers to simply care for the neighbor. In other words, is it edifying and useful for others? So, how do I practice this in my life? Does an educator practice it the same way as a social worker? No. Does a nurse practitioner practice it the same way as a university professor? No. <clears throat> It's not meant to be one size fits all. It's meant to open each person to a world of gratuity and superabundance in the best way possible. It's related to the condition, they say directly, in which one finds oneself. My situation as a president is very different than the situation of, let's say, a lay person on staff. The needs are different, the necessities are different, the utilities are different. But each of us is called to live in his or her own way this economy of gratuity, interdependence, and graciousness, freely given, freely exchanged. The greater the need of the neighbor, the more is expected because it pays attention to what I have that I can give to anyone who is poor or suffering in any way at all. The possession of the superfluous is for distribution. I don't have much when I go to a hospital and I visit a dying person. I can do nothing for them. What can I give them? I give them what I can give them, presence. <clears throat> Patient endurance. A little bit of companionship. Hope. Very different in the classroom, where I can give more. Very different in administration, where I can give still more. It's wide open for practice and life. So Bonaventure defines our way of life, renouncing ownership without rejecting use. Everything we have is given to us to use for ourselves, and for our neighbor. It's the great commandment. <clears throat> Accepting use without claiming ownership. That means this is mine, thank you very much, not yours. Thank you very much. Observing austerity in this use so I don't verge over into hoarding <laughs> or greed or holding the superfluous. But remember, it varies from person to person. Abstaining from the necessities of life without abstaining from the necessities of life. And the necessities of life are different. 
depending on needs, custom, inheritance, worldview, upbringing. I just returned from Scottsdale, Arizona, and their necessities are very different than mine. And yet, they're very generous. Providing for our needs without deviating from austerity. So that I'm always aware of how my superfluous, what can I give, to whom can I give it, how can I give it to those around me? And so that's the Franciscan option, personally, institutionally, communally. Hospitals, lots of Franciscan hospitals, trying to give witness to this the way a hospital does, not the way a school does, and not the way a soup kitchen does. Soup kitchens, three sisters enjoying each other, They're, they're digging a hole for a building. Classrooms. People in the inner city. All of those very, very different things are Franciscan options. A family getting together, sharing, could be a Franciscan option. A school could be a Franciscan option. A hospital. This gives witness in concrete daily life to an economia franciscana. Thank you very much. Thank you.